the Paul Leslie interviews. I'm here in Peachtree City. I'm sitting down with Ellen Hunter Olkin. She's the author of Beautiful Dreamer, The Life of Stephen Collins Foster. Thank you for meeting with me. Well, thank you for coming to interview me. It's a pleasure. I think the first question would be kind of just to tell us a little bit about yourself. Just tell us a little background. Who are you? <laughs> well, I was born in North Florida. Until I was eight years old, I lived in a couple of little North Florida towns. And when I was eight, my father joined the military, and I traveled all my young life with him from Army post to Army post. I trained as a nurse after I graduated from high school and worked for several years as a flight attendant. Then went back to nursing part-time for many years. And when I retired, I wrote this little story about Stephen Foster because there's a memorial to him in the little county I'm from in North Florida. And the memorial is quite a beautiful one with a Carillion Tower that plays his songs and a museum with a, with a, several dioramas concerning the titles of his most famous early songs. It was a, an oasis of culture there in my little rural county. And also, we, um, that would be getting into the Stephen Foster songs, we heard the song Way Down Upon the Swanee River all my life. And we swam in the river when we were young. And when we traveled through these army bases here and there and everywhere, the song would take us home in spirit. And this quality of Foster songs, this nostalgic quality, is what makes them appeal to people. And of course, for us, it was a very personal thing. The rest of my family may not have been as drawn to the song as I was, but I always loved it. It always made me think of home, my grandmother's, when we were traveling away from there. So so the title of your book, it's Beautiful Dreamer, The Life of Stephen Collins Foster. What made you want to write a book about this songwriter, Stephen Foster? Well, as I said, there was a wonderful memorial to him in my home county in Florida, and it made me aware of his fame. I always enjoyed the songs, and when I decided to write something, the first thing that occurred to me was that I would like to find out more about Foster and possibly write a little booklet, which is actually what I came up with. The book is only about 100 pages. And it's only a sketch of his life. I read all the biographers before I wrote the book. So I had a good idea of the ups and downs of his his journey. And he, he didn't live long. But I took the highlights of what I read and put them in my little book. Hmm. You said he didn't live long. What kind of man was he? What was he like from what you researched and uncovered? He was a very sensitive boy, and he didn't like school. When he was young, he always preferred to be in the fields with his flute or with his notebook. His parents urged him to stay in school, and he did for a long time. But then somewhere in his teens, they put him in a school outside of Pittsburgh. They lived in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and three or four days later, he had an opportunity to to hitchhike home with somebody else, and he, he did. And then they, they gave up. Hmm. And and when he would always, he studied at home. He helped his, in his father's business a little bit, and he studied music. He had friends who were musicians, and he wasn't lazy. He just wanted to do what he wanted to do. And he was something of a genius, I would say. And as a songwriter, which he became at a pretty young age, he had a lot of friends around Pittsburgh, and they they sang, and, and they often met together, and their entertainment would be around the piano. He just gradually began writing some of the songs that his friends sang for him, and then he slowly started getting published and had a career for himself. It was a very difficult time. The money was scarce, jobs were scarce, and you needed 
to have an expertise in something. He could have maybe gone to work at a church as the musical director. He was quite talented. He could play instruments, but he didn't really want to do that. He wanted to make his own music and write his own songs, and that's what he did. He probably was the first full-time songwriter in American history. Most people were having a hard scrabble life with a job trying to keep food on the table. He did get a lot of support from his family in the beginning years. There were years where he did support himself and a small family, but then later on it became hard for him to make enough money for him and for Jane, his wife, Jane and their child, and they divorced and or they separated, and he went to New York the last years of his life. But he was a good man, had lots of friends, spent most of his time in his muse, dreaming of poems and music to go with. As someone who appreciates his songs, just to get your personal opinion, what song do you regard as Stephen Foster's greatest masterpiece? Well, I like many of the songs, and I have a lot of favorites. I can't say there's one favorite. The last song he did, the last good song he did, was Beautiful Dreamer. And I think I like the song because it's a bit magical, not only the music but also the words, and it describes Foster himself. He was very much a dreamer. And that's why I named the book Beautiful Dreamer. It is a very nice song. Foster lived in a time when there was a lot of death and illness, a lot of tragedy and loss of family members. So people mourned. People spent a lot of time mourning. And he wrote several songs about death and, and losing friends. And, and some of those are his very best songs, really. There's one, Gentle Annie, another one, Old Black Joe, about people he knew that died. They're wonderful songs. But he was basically, he was an optimistic person, and he had a happy nature, too. And he wrote a lot of songs that were full of merriment and fun. And uh, I like Ring Ring the Banjo and Nellie Bly of those. Oh, there's several. Camp Down Races is a, is a nice one about betting on the horses. There's a beautiful lullaby, Slumber My Darling, and then there's a love song. He didn't have that much success with his love songs, but there's one called No One to Love that speaks volumes for people who have not yet found the love of their life. There's a great variety of music, happy, sad, all kinds, and some classical things. He wanted to appeal to the finest tastes of Americans, and he wrote several polkas, scottishes, and he did some arranging of other people's music. He was quite accomplished. We're speaking with Ellen Hunter Olkin. She's the author of Beautiful Dreamer, The Life of Stephen Collins Foster. What made Stephen Foster such a great songwriter? Foster lived on the river. He lived in Pittsburgh and Cincinnati most of his life. He had this sense of travel and movement that was ever-present in his era because it was the time of westward expansion, and there was a lot of energy in the river towns. He somehow infused this kind of energy into a lot of his music, and I think that is one of the reasons the songs just caught on. They were memorable, they were hummable, and the gold miners took them out west, and the trailblazers took them towards Oregon, and they just caught on all over the country, just like the wind. I think he just captured the mood of the country. Hmm. I believe that that is what happened. And since he was a full-time songwriter, he could devote himself to making every word right and every note right. And he did, he did that. Some of the music is very, very impressive. Why do you think his work has endured? 
I can think of artists from not too many years ago that have recorded his music. And then also, he's mentioned in the film Tombstone. Wyatt Earp, or one of the characters, is asked by one of the cowboys, do you know any Stephen Foster? So, I mean, his work has endured. So why do you think that is? For one thing, there are two states that adopted Foster songs as their state songs. Way down upon the Swanee River is the state song of Florida, where I'm from, and Old Kentucky Home is the state song of Kentucky. The song is played every year before the Derby. It opens the Derby. The people in Kentucky have a beautiful memorial to, to Foster. It's at Bardstown, and it's in the old Rowan Mansion. Rowan was a, a cousin, it was a relative of Foster's. They call that old mansion the Old Kentucky Home, and they had a park around it with another Carillion Tower that plays Foster songs and a, a museum, gift shop. And then every summer for for the warm months in an outdoor theater, they do a show, a Foster show. Tells the story of his life. It's not exactly all true, but they play a lot of the songs in the show. And it's just that one theater, as far as I know, that celebrates Foster in that way, but it's every summer. Then in Pittsburgh, where he's from, the town of Lawrenceville, which is a little suburb of Pittsburgh, but it's in the city now. But when Stephen Foster's father subdivided the little town of Lawrenceville, it was way outside of the city. But they celebrate the Foster family because they're all buried right there in Lawrenceville at the Allegheny Cemetery. And it's, a, it's an important part of their history they have a, an annual celebration called Duda Day. That just started about six or seven years ago, I think, the Duda Days. So they keep Foster alive that way in Pittsburgh. Plus in Pittsburgh, his hometown, there's a beautiful museum with a collection of Foster memorabilia. All his sheet music is there, uh, his instruments that he played, the melodeon that he played growing up, many other things. This was a collection that belonged to a wealthy pharmaceutical manufacturer's name is Josiah Lilly, who loved Foster songs when he was alive, and he was just determined to do what he could to make sure they lasted. And he funded the museum in Pittsburgh. I think even the building and the collections. They, well, he had already, during his lifetime, collected everything he could find on Foster. And he put them, I believe he funded the museum building that went up for the collection that he left to the University of Pittsburgh. it He may not have left it to the University of Pittsburgh, it, but it is associated with the University of Pittsburgh now. And this Josiah Lilly, he also funded the memorial to Foster in Florida, in White Springs, Florida, which is probably not as well known as the one in Pittsburgh, but it's there and it's, and it's, it's a nice one. So there are three memorials to him. And there are other memorials that are smaller, statues and here and there. But these three, and this very wealthy man that was determined to keep his music alive, also helped. I think that helped a lot. I'm trying to think if there's any, any other ramifications there. And the fact that the music is, so many of the songs are simple, memorable tunes that just people just like to hear. On that note, is there a recording, because unfortunately we don't know what Stephen Foster's voice sounded like. No. He, he was before the age of recording, but today there's still artists who can record Stephen Foster's songs. Is there a recording of a Stephen Foster song that to you is a particularly good rendition, like a favorite recording? There are a few CDs that I have at home that have rendered Foster's music using old instruments, using the melodeon and flute and banjo. I cannot, on the spur of the moment, think of the names of the artists, but I have two or three that are, that are pretty good. One group is called Homefront. They perform at the Duda Days almost every year. And they're just a simple band. And they have a couple of singers. 
that work the songs with duets, and, and they're nice. There's been a classical recording done of Foster Music. I'm trying to think of the tenor's name. I want to say Hampson or Hampton. His CD is nice, too. There is, of course, a CD of the show that's done in Bardstown every summer. Don't know that it's so special, but it has a lot of music on it. We're talking with Ellen Hunter Olkin. She's the author of Beautiful Dreamer, The Life of Stephen Collins Foster. What was the most surprising thing that you learned as a result of writing this book? Well, I think what is shocking and surprising is that Foster died poor in New York during the Civil War. He didn't earn much from his songs. The royalties were not very big. And during the Civil War, the royalties from the South were not paid at all. And that was where he had the most popularity. So he was really working, he was writing songs, mostly hymns and soldier songs. He was writing songs every day, and he would take them to the publisher, and they would buy them, but he didn't earn very much. He had a pretty difficult last year, years, but he didn't seem to care that much, and he, by then, he was drinking quite a bit. It sort of ruled his life, I think, towards the end of his life, though he never stopped writing songs. But it was surprising to me that someone that made the music as beautiful as Foster did would be broke at the end of his life and living from hand to mouth. There could be some people who would be maybe critical of some of the earlier lyrics. Someone would maybe say that some of the language he used was racially insensitive. What would you say about that? How would you respond to that kind of observation? When Foster was a young man, the popular music was associated with the minstrel shows. And if you were going to have a song that people were going to listen to, you would have to have one that could be performed on the minstrel stage. So he wrote for the minstrels in the beginning of his career. And there were some songs that had troublesome lyrics that poked fun at sometimes black people, but also poked fun at the upper classes and not just black people. But in modern times, some have taken issue with the lyrics in Foster's songs, and there's been some controversy. And as far as having the songs mean as much today as they did in Foster's time, the lyrics seem at times a little antiquated, the wordage, but the songs are good anyway. The melodies are fresh and uh, beautiful. You just have to ignore the little bit antiquated language and listen to the music. What would you say to anyone listening in? I would say that there's a great variety of music in the Foster Treasury, and anyone can find some favorites. And even if the lyrics are sometimes a bit antiquated today. The melodies are fresh and timeless. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed this time. I've enjoyed immersion into Stephen Foster. Well, thank you for interviewing me. I hope I haven't left important things out. <laughs> thank you.